special welcome to our distinguished speakers, Dr. Sunil Khaparde and Nandita Venkatesan. STM Health Justice Lecture Series Chair Professor Rama Kant. Other participants, welcome everyone. Shanti Devi Memorial Health Justice Lecture Series is a series of online lectures, or you can call them e talks, exploring intersectoral solutions for specific lung for specific health problems. Health is an outcome, influencer, and enabler of sustainable development. So do we believe. This lecture is hosted preferably on the second Friday of every month. Let me introduce the chair of Shanti Devi Memorial Health Justice Lecture Series. One of the children of late Mrs. Shanti Devi Shankadhar, Professor Dr. Rama Kant, continues to be actively engaged on a range of health and social causes. Professor Ramakant received the WHO Director General's Award in 2005 and has been the former head of surgery department at King George's Medical University and former chief medical superintendent of King George's Medical University as well. He is the former national president of Association of Surgeons of India, former vice president of Sark Surgeons, and currently he is the president of Lucknow College of Surgeons and principal and dean of GCRG Institute of Medical Sciences and Hospitals. Over to you, Professor Ramakant. Thank you very much, Madam Sova. Welcome to this special episode of Shanti Devi Memorial Health Justice Lecture Series. We will try our best to address both visually and hearing challenge participants here. It's a very peculiar situation. Featuring viewpoints of Head of the India's national TV programs, alongside one of the most powerful patient advocates, TV survivor and journalist, Nandita Venkatesan. Regarding uh, Mr. Shanti Devi, let me share briefly and pay tribute to my mother, late Mr. Shanti Devi Shankadar, in whose memory this lecture is instituted. Mr. Shanti Devi Shankadar was born in rural parts of Uttar Pradesh, UP, India. Despite odds and challenges of social and economic inequality, gender disparity, she boldly confronted these stereotypes and she lived her life upholding values and having a life influencing impact on others. She passed away on 21st December 2006. Uh, about today's lecture, the SGM Health Justice Lecture Series feature noted health experts from around the world and those who have devotedly worked on specific health issues and interlinked this within health sector as well as between health and non-health sectors. Focus of each lecture is to explore solutions that require intersectoral collaboration for improving specific program outcomes. About this month's lecture, let me share my over 40 years long experience with thousands of patients of empyema thoracic, which is a very complicated lung disease and one of the important cause of which is tuberculosis. I have been witness to TB related empyema disabilities through lives of hundreds of such patients and how lives transform towards near normalcy with proper and timely treatment, care, support and compassion. Today's lecture will be delivered by two keynote speakers, Dr. Sonil Khabarde, Head of India's Revised National TV Program and Director, Deputy Director General DDG uh, at Ministry of Health and Family Welfare Government of India a very well-known person in the field of tuberculosis. Nandita Venkatesan, Economic Times journalist, two times TV survivor, discovered Bharat Natyam dance form to cope with her journey and is living with profound deafness. She has a powerful message to convey to regarding the disabilities created by the medical treatment, which sometimes can happen. About this issue, I'd like to say initially that anti-tubercular drugs save lives. No doubt about it, and antibiotics also save lives, but irrational therapies and host of other structural barriers leave us with real life situation where people may get cured of TB, but some live with disability almost lifelong. This is not acceptable. We need to change this into reality if we truly believe India can end TB by 2025 and world can eliminate TB by 2030. Now I will say thanks to the head of India's national TV program and EDG of Ministry of Health, Dr. Suril Khapade, and champion patient advocate Bharat Natyam dancer, 
TED speaker, journalist Nandita Venkatesan for accepting to deliver this talk. I'd like to invite now Dr. Kapare to present. Please, over to you, Dr. Kapare. Please. As you very well know that TB is a, one of the major public health problem globally as well as in India. TB kills more, disease, more than any disease in India itself. And yes, the TB is one of the top 10 causes of the death in the worldwide. It has a related with a catastrophic cost effect on his family and individuals. And as such, nutrition, poverty, and TB has already interlinked. And as you very well know, the vicious cycles of these social determinants, which is attached with the TB. In such situation, the TB is required intersectorial responses from the multi-sectorial responses as well as the multi-interministerial coordination to just tackle this problem. TB, as you know, is not only a medical problem, but it has a social determinants which is attached. And a lot of social determinants are like poverty, living in the slums, in ill ventilations, living in the tribal area, inaccessible, HIV, TB. These are the various social determinants which really make the person more vulnerable for the TB itself. And that's why the heat is not only within the sector or within the health sector, but it is beyond the health sector. And that's why intersectoral responses is very much required in TB. Globally, as well as India, you know that very well, that incidence of the TB, TB is 10.5 million Populations are having every year infected with the T uh, is uh, having the TB, and out of that, 27% of the burden is in India itself. If you see the mortality of the TB is also very very high, and about if you see the mortality due to TB itself in India itself, if you see the contributed about 34% of the mortality globally in India itself. If a TB, HIV TB and MDR TB is one of the highest TB uh, burden in the world itself and having the highest number of TB cases in India. As you know, the tuberculosis, as you know that uh, having a lot of achievement during the last 20 years, we have seen that program has already achieved a lot of things. But uh, still uh, is one of the top 10 cause of the death worldwide. And also in, in India, if you see that is one of the ill, one of the killer disease in India itself. And a lot of mortality is happening due to the TB. But 4.8 people, uh, like people, are dying every year because of the tuberculosis. And if you see the economical impact of the TB itself is very, very high on the family as well as on the uh, community as well as on the individual also. There is a lot of shortage of gap, or we can say the financial gap of the TB in the country itself and in globally also, about 2 million, 2 billion uh, US dollars gaps are there as far as TB is, con TB, is uh, TB is concerned. And we require to have a sustainable financing for the TB, then only we can able to tackle this particular problem. No doubt we have already achieved the Millennium Development Goal. We have reduced or dropped out our prevalence more than 50% by within the last 10 years. And our incidence in India also we have reduced by 50%. But if you see the incidence falls in very, very low uh, level, that is 1.2% per year. And that is not uh, sufficient uh, to achieve the goal of MGD, uh, of the NTB strategy itself. As far as the RNTC is concerned, we have seen that about 3.5 million additional lives has been saved is you know that we already achieved the goal of Millennium Development Goal in 2015, but now we are moving toward the era of the SDG. And Government of India and the Ministry of Health is already endorsed with the SDG goal itself. And as you very well know that goal three is where is mainly related with the health and well-being, and especially HIV, TB, and malaria is one on that particular target. Within our, uh, we are already developed our target to achieve the sustainable development goal by 2030. If you want to achieve the SDG goal, then we have to see that how the target has been achieved and we have to develop some indicators also in the country itself. SDG goals, if you see the SDG goal number one, which is related to the poverty, SDG goal number two, which is related to hunger, 
and also seven affordable and clean energy, which are SDG goal eight, sustainable economical growth and reduce the inequality to SDG 10, 10. These all these are interlinked with the health directly or inter internationally, uh, uh, directly as well as indirectly. We have having a lot of social factors as well as universal uh, factors which are also related to the health that HIV, diabetes, smoking, alcohol use, and also uh, we have seen that universal health coverage is one of the very important and for that we have to see that how we can increase our health spending per capita as well as the coverage of essential health coverage uh, to the my meaning of the universal health coverage means uh, each and every person of the country uh, should get uh, accessible with the health quality of health and quality of diagnosis as well as diagnostic as well as treatment protocol as per the quality uh, treatment should be given to each and every person apart from his race, cost, uh, age or any political situation or any uh, whether he's a prisoner or being, everybody should get a universal health coverage. That is the meaning of the universal health coverage each and every person should get. Uh, the health uh, the TB related services that is one of the very important goal, which is already encompasses in our national strategic plan itself. Vision, as you very well know, we are already having the develop the vision for the TB. That is reduction. We want. We are already having the reduction of the TB number of deaths by 2030s and 95 percent. At the same time, reduction in TB incidence by around 90 percent. That is the goal which we want to achieve by 2030 to the sustainable development goal. And as far as India is concerned, we have already advanced this particular goal to achieve this, this particular goal uh, before the sustainable development goal in 2025. And that is already in national strategic plan. We are already, uh, uh, already incorporated that elimination of the TB by 2025. It is no doubt is very ambitious, but we have to reduce our incidence as well as the number of death or mortality by 2025 by 90% and 80%, 80%. That is a very, very important part of this particular vision and goal and targeting. Third important goal is a catastrophic cost, which is directly related with our social determinant. Because social determinants of the TB as you know, poverty related determinants are mainly affecting the TB. And there is a vicious cycle for the poverty TB and malnutrition and that also, the person is affected with the TB are mainly a, a, proportionately more in the low socioeconomic people as well as the people who are poor. In such situation, we have to see that how the catastrophic cost facing by the family as well as the individual has to be reduced, and that is a, a one of the alter, a, one of the very important goal and uh, for the TB control program, which is already under the national strategy plan. Universal health coverage and social protections are has been taken as a very paramount importance in the national strategic plan. If you see our national strategic plan itself, we have given the, uh, the it is based on the principle of equity, social justice, as well as the universal health coverage, and that all the principles of the social justice and human right has been undertaken when we are just talking about the TB. Because TB is not we are considering is only the social medical problem. But it has a social and developmental problem, and we have to see that unless we have go beyond health or beyond this medical problem, we cannot achieve the goal of NTB strategy and social protection, which is very very important. For that, the government expenditure of health has to be increased. Out of pocket expenditure of the individuals has to be reduced and then only we are able to achieve this particular. For that, a various schemes has already been incorporated for the uh, reducing the out-of-pocket expenditure, availability of the national health insurance, social protection scheme, and reduce the medical and uh, medical cost and uh, diagnostic cost of the patient that has to be taken into consideration when we are just talking about a TB. The challenges in India, as you very well know, there are so many challenges are there in the India for the as far as TB is concerned. We know that involvement of the private sector is very, very important because very suboptimal involvement of the uh, private sectors 
are uh, existing in the, uh, uh, today is in India, and we require that more than 50 to 60 percent of patients who are going to the private sector. We have to engage this private sector in a positive manner, and so that at least their involvement, and so that patient will get a benefit of, out of that, and patient should get the same uh, protocol treatment what the standard for TB care uh, is has already been endorsed or already been envisaged. So that's why this uh, there is a need for involving the private sectors and training them and sensitizing them. Yeah, mostly the, another important challenge is the in uh, the treatment outcome due to the drug resistance TB. We required a better regimen. We required a shorter regime. We required a better regime for them so that at least and better diagnostic facility so that at least early diagnosis and treatment and better better uh, regimes is required for MDRTB, which is very, very existing in regimes are very, very uh, low height uh, du duration treatment. So we have to shorten that treatment and system of uh, uh, di diagnostic regimes are already available in the world. We have to use that and we have to see that the patient should get benefited out of that. Reaching to unreached is one of the major problems, especially you know that one million population has already been already there who are most vulnerable in the community are already are not reachable to the services and not accessible to the services. These are the population which are in the slums, tribal and most vulnerable and they are transmitting the disease within that particular community and that we have to see that we have to go like a polio or a campaign where each house to house we have to go like uh, we have already started on the program a active case finding which is uh, very, very important so that we can see that all this out uh, re unreached population can be uh, bring in the program and they have to be immediately uh, early diagnosis and treatment has to be provided to them, the services. Third important challenge is the comorbidity like HIV, TB, diabetes uh, and uh, TB, tobacco. These are the comorbidity. These are most people are more uh, having the more comorbidity means that they are having the most uh, uh, risk factors are already associated with HIV and TB, diabetes and as well as the morbidity and mortality is also they are very high amongst this low morbidity and that is a, one of the major problem in India because HIV is also very high in the country, diabetes is also very high and tobacco consumption is also very high in the country and that contributed, attributed to the TB itself in a very high amount and that's why this population has to be intensive highly we have to case detection has to be done in this area. Um, determinants of the TB as nutrition, overcrowding and all these things has to be tackled. This is a major problem because this is beyond the health and we have to see that intersectorial and coordination or interministerial coordination is required. Out of pocket expenditure I already told that is one of the major uh, problems in the families because most of the people who are have, who are Suffering from TB are uh, low socioeconomic and having a very poor uh, poverty uh, related factors are already associated with them and that's why we have to see that this challenge has to be taken into consideration. We have already recently developed the national strategic plan as you know uh, 2017 to 2025 and our objective and our main goal is to eliminate the TB by 2025 must be higher ahead than the sustainable development goal. For that is a no doubt is a very aggressive, <laughs> we, it is more ambitious so we have to go very fast and we have to go very aggressively. So for this the most, most trust area we already identify in the private sector engagement where the major patients are going. Reaching to a risk where the future people are not accessible to the services and they are most vulnerable, we have to risk to them. Second is the TB comorbidities uh, like TB HIV, TB diabetes, TB tobacco. We have intensified the case finding in this area and bi-directional uh, uh, screening has to be done in this area. Multisectorial response is very much required because health, this particular problem will not only sort out only by a health department but it is beyond health and that's why multisectorial and we have to take the paucity of the SDGs, that sustainable development goal where the, all the department, uh, most of the department having the goal to achieve this particular sustainable development goal like food, energy or this uh, agriculture or hunger. These are the goals which has to be achieved. So we have to take the possibility and we have to see that uh, develop some interministerial co coordination with them and see that uh, 
we have to achieve uh, our upper goal of achieving the uh, NTB by 2025. ICT tools, and this is very, very important, and uh, yeah, because most of the people have, we are, know that adherence and monitoring has to be done through the ICT services. No doubt, our DOT strategy will be def definitely a personal protection, personal um, uh, adherence systems will also be there like DOTs and all. But at the same time, we have to see the eyes in the vast country and where the people is having mobile and everything with them. So we have to see that these particular ICT approaches uh, for adherence and monitoring and counseling has to be uh, even important. Uh, and already in the National Strategy Plan, we have just taken that into consideration. Active case finding with a new initiative is not a new initiative, but is a uh, the under national strategy plan, we have given more emphasis for the active case finding, going to the just like in polio in campaign mode. We are do we already done the two rounds of active case finding and very good responses. The cases which are missing in the country are already in the fold of the government, and we are giving treating treating them early and detecting them early, and also uh, we are getting more and more symptomatic cases and putting them into treatment under the active case finding, and we. And the second round in the just last month, that is in uh, July uh, 30th, is finished and still some uh, some of the states are continuing that particular active case finding in the uh, country itself. So these are the one of the very important interventions under the program. As you know, I already told that this particular uh, we are already having the TB is not a social problem, but it is required a multi-sectoral approach because it's a medical and social problem. And we require to have the intersectoral coordination between the deep, different department, health, um, food and supply, and uh, social justice, tribal welfare, women and child development, environmental forest, all these departments. Because if you see the social factors are overcrowding, poor housing, indoor air pollution, migrant, tribals, HIV, comorbidity, smoking, indoor smoking, uh, pollution. All these other factors which are attributed to the TB itself, and that's why unless we approach, our approach will be beyond the health, and then only we can achieve the goal of uh, NTB or the eliminating the TB by 2020, or we have to reach to that 90 and 90 percent of the morbidity and 95 percent of the case reduction. That is uh, very important. Third is important is the patient support. What are the patient support is required? The patient support means treatment support, ethical uh, human rights issues, which is, as you know, uh, uh, TB health is itself. If you see the WHO definition of the health itself, it is the highest attainable, attainable uh, attaining uh, the uh, level of the health that by the every each and every person. That is the actually uh, that is the one of the fundamental rights under the WHO's definition of the health itself and we have to see the ethics as well as the human rights. We, we have to give the social justice to the patient and in such situation we have to see that all the human rights issues and all the ethics is to be provided, social justice has to be provided to this patient. We have to see that comorbidity uh, management and nutritional support incentives to the patient. One of the very important support which we are envisaged in our national strategic plan is the providing a uh, making the propo proposal to provide the incentives to the patient, uh, all the TB patient. Now, at, at exact, uh, today, uh, uh, existingly, we are just giving only uh, uh, incentives to the tribal and also the dot provider. But in future, plan is there to give the incentive to the patients, uh, uh, all the TB patient. Uh, that is already on the proposal itself through our direct. Uh, benefit uh, direct DBT then direct benefit transfer the reducing the out of ex uh, pocket expenditure what what is this means means we have to see that how the travel cost or the wages of the patient has to be compensated the nutritional services has to be given to the patient because mostly the nutrition is a big problem in the tuberculosis is activated and also also reduce the uh, 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 it increase the adherence of the services also the wages loss, out of pocket expenditure, second, the cost of the diagnosis, the cost of the treatment, we have to give the free treatment. Under the national strategic plan, we already given 
this particular facility giving the free, free, up, free up treatment to the MDR as well as the travel, uh, For travel costs and nutrition costs, we are proposing to give some incentive to the patient. At the same time, diagnostic, for the diagnostic purpose also, we are giving the free diagnostic services to the patient so that is the, uh, there is, will be definitely a reduction in the reduction in the uh, out of pocket expenditure of the patient and also so family. This particular all incentives and all this we are just invested in the program is that under national strategic plan is to, to provide this to the direct benefit transfer that is moving we are moving toward one of the very ambitious program of the Prime Minister office and uh, to provide all the benefits or cash benefit to the patient directly to his account and we are having the system already we are having mixture we are having the Pradhan Mantri Janadhan Yojana uh, which is already been uh, already is a lot of uh, most of the people is having the saving accounts in their name and we are having a lot of other uh, uh, social welfare activities our uh, schemes are there and also Niksha is there which is already web based case based uh, uh, notification tool or we can say the uh, uh, surveillance tool which is mainly notifying the patient and also registering the patient. Once we know this, all these systems together we can give this direct benefit transfer to, uh, in form of incentive to the patient through this DBT and for that government or Ministry of Health and RNTCB has issued a guided notification to provide all the services, all the incentives which is existing in the country through the direct benefit transfer. Nutrition also we have already uh, developed the nutrition guideline uh, recently in last uh, World TB day we already released that particular guidance document for nutritional care and support to the TB patient and also lot of supports which is uh, existing in the government scheme like public distribution system or food security schemes and uh, which will be also linked with this particular extra, uh, extra nutritional support to the TB patient linkages with the inter interventions with the managing the under nutrition also and linkages with the local government and self-help group like uh, some of the states has already done like Kerala, Chhattisgarh, Himachal Pradesh we have already given this particular nutritional support uh, to the patient of the TB uh, this will definitely and we want that this particular government uh, which will link with some schemes also in this situation Ethical responsibility is also very, very important. Focus on social justice uh, because as you see that our national strategy plan, the principally uh, behind is that giving the social justice, equity and all, whether it is any caste, any price or any ethics, we have to see that is, he should get, uh, provide a social justice uh, under the treatment and under the diagnosis also. Winning the trust and cooperation of the patient. Ethical responsibility of the healthcare worker and addressing the migrant leaving no one behind that is uh, one of the you know, slogan last year we had uh, and uh, we have to see that uh, all the responsibility and sympathy, sympathy toward the patient and children is very very important and we have to see that children and women has to be taken and gender sensitivity has to be very important part as far as the TB control program is concerned and community and doctors and ethical obligation uh, to the fund research is very very important part. As you know the we cannot achieve this particular activity or NTB strategy unless the, we have to tackle this TB HIV comorbidity because we, this comorbidity is already as you know there is a lot of coordination between HIV and TB. We have to intensify case finding in this particular area. At the same time we have already provided a CBN facility to this particular uh, this uh, HIV uh, this population uh, PLHIV so that immediately we can identify the case and put upon treatment. Daily regimen for this PLHIV is also been started in the country in the, almost all the ART center and airborne prevention uh, as you see the prevention is also very important airborne infection control measures which has already been uh, uh, issued to the most of the state that is airborne infection control measures uh, given under RNTCP has to be followed by the all ART and MDRTB patient wards also. IPT the in uh, uh, ionized uh, prophylactic treatment that is, uh, um, that is also uh, we are already under the program and for the TBHIV patient uh, uh, under the coordination uh, 
this framework we are giving the IPT also to the patient who is having the HIV positive uh, so that they can prevent from the TB also. And ICT based adherence support system is also there under HIV TB coordination. We are already from, uh, developed the sum of the diabetes TB and joint TB tobacco collaborative activity also. Because as you know, the diabetes is rampant in the country itself, and we have to see that how this diabetes and TB bidirectional screening can be done. Uh, and both are reciprocally help each other and that is why we are developed the, some guideline also and uh, where the bi-directional screening and also the advice has been given in this particular joint tobacco is a tobacco is also having a lot of morbidity mortality the if a person is having a TB a four time more high, higher mortality is there if a person is a TB in such situation we have to see that this uh, mortality has to be reduced and we are developed this particular some of the advice we are giving to the T at the TB sensations clinics as well as the uh, TB dot centers also we are just uh, giving some advice for the TB sensations also. Next important is the airborne infection control is a no doubt is a very very important aspect prevention uh, we are not up till now in the program we are mainly concentrating on treatment and uh, diagnosis treatment. The prevention was not given that much important. But now, under the national strategic plan, we have to see that how we can give the uh, this particular prevention uh, uh, for which the RNTCP has already developed the airborne infection control guideline also, and which already contain all the providing N95 masks, IC, IC at a uh, OPD, and uh, develop the curve corners and counters and separate IP facility for bacteriological positive BS and, and cuff etiquettes, smoking pollution and overcrowding prevention. All these are the measures are already, but these are beyond the health. Some, some of the things are very difficult to uh, operationalize also. This required uh, help from the different partners and from different sectors also. And that's why intersector coordination is one of the very important part as per the TB is concerned. We are already having preventive measures like INS preventive therapy for the people living with HIV and for children and close contact of the infected cases. LTB is again we are just thinking over that very high risk population we have to give latent TB uh, management uh, also as a part of a small part of our program itself where we are starting with the high risk population and those take are those districts who are already having risk to that particular level, very low prevalence rate or risk uh, burden is there. We can start LTB uh, uh, management also, let TB management also. So other department which we have to uh, see is the uh, collaboration is the National Urban Health Mission because most of the cities and like uh, most of the metropolitan cities where the uh, this national urban health mission is already been incorporating, uh, uh, implementing the program itself. We have to incorporate, we have to collaborate with this TB services with this because urban slums and all these things are a big problem of TB and where the transmission is very fast. And in such situation, we have to see that how urban health uh, can be attached, uh, linked with the RNTCP and we are already under TB control program. We are already taken this particular area and under the strategic intervention. Again, the private sector, as you very well know, the private sector is one of the very important. This thing, the TB patient outside the public health sector uh, uh, is a real need of the country and know that 50 to 60 percent of private sector patients are there. We have to see that public sector, private sector, and patient and community, and we have to develop some model of interface which can help uh, sensitize the private sectors and give the accessibility, the quality diagnostic services and patient support to the TB patient and reduce the out-of-pocket expenditure so that we can give any drugs free to the patient who is attending the private sector and also the patient who is who, who also giving the private uh, private sector patient will also provide a free diagnostic and free uh, treatment and also the social support and so public health action will be taken, will be given to such type of the patient who is uh, diagnosed or was not notified by the private sector also. So this is the universal access to the patient whether it's the private or in the public and that's uh, one of the biggest challenge and we are having a, one of the biggest 
pillar for the national strategy plan. We know that uh, organizations like Indian Association of Parliamentary and on Population and Development Global Coalition against the TB, coordination with the medical uh, professional like IME, linking uh, IME, IPA, or linking the CRS activity, corporate organization, so that the budget deficit, we can also see that optimally utilize the other extra budgetary activity like CSR activity, corporate organizations who can help so that at least the patient will get benefited and we can achieve the goal of NDB. And at last I will say that TB is a not only a problem which can be sorted what the health, but it is the beyond health and intersectoral coordination is a must and required. And if today's our, if you see this graph itself, we are seeing that we are reducing by one to two percent per year the incidence. But if you want to achieve the goal of NDB strategy by 2025, we have to use all, optimize the, our current tools, use the universal health coverage and social protection, and then only we will be able to achieve or uh, reduce the 10% of reduction in our uh, our incidence itself. And in future, even any vaccines of any new prophylactic treatments comes uh, in the country, shorter regime or shorter regime for prophylaxis, IPT, such type of regimes and such type of diagnostic ICT will also help <coughs> in reducing the incidence of the TB and all these efforts are required to reach, reach to the goal of NTB because this is uh, NTB strategy's goals but India is going beyond that we are reaching we want to reach by 2025 so we required too much uh, we have to go very fast very aggressive and all component and all collaboration uh, is required from partners and everywhere from international organization partners and everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Dr. Sunil Kapale. Very nicely you covered the whole topic which was very difficult and uh, really I appreciate it. Now uh, we'll take questions after the second speaker also has presented. Uh, dear friends, Nandita Vegetation is a journalist with Economic Times and two times survivor of intestinal tuberculosis and she got cured of it but lived with profound deafness and is an acknowledged Bharatnatyam dancer. Big salute to you Nandita or to break the silence on this issue of hearing loss related to TB. Over to you Nandita now. Please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you so much for introducing me. I'm Nandita Venkateshan. As you heard me say now, hello, hello, I was just trying to see if I'm able to hear or not. Because the fact is that I am 90% hearing impaired. I cannot hear anything what Dr. Sunil Kapurde just spoke. I was only reading his PowerPoint presentation and the and the devil here for my hearing loss is the disease named tuberculosis. Let me start by telling what happened to me and why it is so important to include disabilities in the agenda for ending TB. I am a two-time intestinal TB survivor. I had TB for the first time a month after I started my graduation studies in 2007. I was detected with intestinal TB, a relatively rare form of the disease, I was told so. The diagnosis happened quite late. It, I was diagnosed almost three months after I first started showing my symptoms, namely stomach pain, nausea, vomiting, fever in the nights for a couple of hours. I was on medication for over 18 months of anti-TB treatment, the first line drugs. I was declared cured. I then went on to pursue my post-graduation studies. The first bout of TB was definitely not easy. I was so young and I found it extremely difficult to deal with all the symptoms and all the side effects of the medicines. I was 17 years when I was diagnosed with it. And at that age when you ought to be thinking about enjoying your college life and going out with friends, all I had in my mind was coming back home and having medications close to 15 tablets several times a day. This was my regimen for the 18 months. With 
much difficulty i finished my first treatment i then went on to pursue my post graduation studies in delhi i came i came to mumbai from where i am i came back to mumbai and i wanted to study further here and take up a job in mumbai itself unfortunately that was not meant to be in 2013 I had a severe reinfection once again. This time the bacteria was meant to deal a blood body blow to me. The drugs did drugs the first line of drugs were administered but none of them worked on me. The doctors then told me that I would need a surgery to remove the infected portion of the intestine, the large intestine. I had my surgery what was supposed to be one surgery and a 10 day hospital stay as per my doctors spiraled into six surgeries yes i'm not joking here six surgeries and an endless nightmare and complications after complications i had to undergo six life saving surgeries and i was in the hospital for close to 3 months this is how i had become as you can see the first the first person is who i was before i was diagnosed the second time and the second one next to you is me yes it is me with my hair gone i had lost a lot of weight close to 32 kg of weight i had lost and was down to 30 kg i had lost all my hair and i had turned bald my skin had turned almost yellow and i was dealing and tethering between life and death six surgeries endless complications creatinine levels up low sugar memory loss ptinr levels high i thought i was done with my quota of pain and over 200 injections yes i thought i was done with my quota of pain but the biggest one was get to arrive for me in november 2013 two days after i celebrated my 24th birthday i woke up from an afternoon nap a 10 minute afternoon nap to pin drop silence in a matter of 10 minutes i had lost my hearing 10 minutes before i slept i had spoken to my mom i had spoken to my brother i had told them i'm going to sleep and i slept after the 10 minute nap i woke up to an entirely silent world i could see the mobile phone playing i could see the tv playing but there was no sound in my world at all i lost my hearing because of a rare side effect of canamycin injection that was administered to me in my in my case the course of canamycin was close to 100 days and i lost my hearing after i after the injection was stopped i was in told about the side effect beforehand at all which meant that the hearing loss came as a bolt from the blue to me i absolutely knew nothing about this at all my doctors had an inform me about such a side effect there was no form of counseling either i before my hearing loss or after my hearing loss i then slipped into a prolonged period of depression for close to 2 years i was severely depressed and i i was detected with depression as a as a side effect for the hearing loss and all the surgeries i was severely depressed for a long time scarily more than all this even my speech abilities took a big hit after my hearing loss for a long time i could not speak properly if i'm speaking to you today don't be surprised that some time back i was undergoing speech therapy so that i could come and speak up and open up about my ordeal i was not able to speak doctors told me it is because of the hearing loss and maybe because of the medication that you were administered my speech abilities went for a big toss i was unable to pronounce basic words for a long time i was unable to move my mouth 
and I had to undergo intensive speech therapy for a long time. All of this meant that I had to I had to take up a huge out of pocket expenditure. My expenses for treating me were close to 50 to 60 lakhs. I had to sell off my house to, to in order to fund my treatment. None of this came easy for me. That is why I am here today to call for an intersectoral, intersectoral approach to Dr. Sunil Khapardi so that he understands that he understands that autotoxicity is a very grave problem. Hearing loss, as I've mentioned here, is the fourth largest contributor for lives with for lives lived with disability. It had severe economic and personal impact for me. I found it very difficult to get a job initially, and psychological illnesses are far more prevalent. Opportunities for people with disabled hearing loss, such as in my case, I have in my case that is called as profound deafness, is very restricted. It is extremely important that the TB division recognizes autotoxicity as a problem for T as a problem that comes with TB. Dr. Kapardi spoke about patient support and management of adverse drug reactions in his presentation. It is precisely to do with this that I'm speaking here with all of you. That after undergoing all of my surgeries and some tremendous amount of trauma, nothing could prepare me for the hearing loss that came on me. And mind you, when I say this, this is not the testimony of me alone. This is the testimony of several people who have undergone hearing, who have undergone hearing loss because of because of drugs such as canamycin or streptomycin. As you all know that India has committed to the WHO's NTV strategy. India has also ratified the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. It is time now, sir, to synergize both these goals and understand that one, it is the responsibility of the TB division equally to see to it that persons who suffer autotoxicity are adequately rehabilitated so that they can start the, start moving ahead in life. Here's what I feel needs to be done. When I speak about TB treatment or an intersectoral approach, I classify it into two sections. First is your prevention part. In, it is extremely important and I strongly believe that audiometry test has to be made a baseline or a follow-up test for anyone who is given second line drugs and for all MDR, XDR patients. Extremely vital that, an, or, that it is a part of the treatment protocol by the government to include audiometry testing. Yes, I understand that economic constraints are there, but I definitely feel that the process should be started at least in the cities, wherein all patients who are given second line drugs are compulsorily performed audiometry tests and, and follow ups are done to check their percentage of hearing. This will help preventing hearing loss for patients who are on TB drugs first and it will also help in improving adherence. Mind you, when I was having TB and I was detected with hearing loss, I had, I had thoughts of giving up on the treatment. I did not. I stuck to the whole treatment, but I know of patients who have given up the treatment midway. And we all know how dangerous that is. It can lead to relapses and it can lead to further drug resistance. Hearing loss is an extremely debilitating thing. And it, and it is high time that audiometry be made a baseline or a follow-up test. And it is included in the treatment protocols of the government. This slide is from the government's 
ebook on prevention of management of adverse reactions with anti tuberculosis drugs and ebook in the government central tb division website which calls for monitoring of early symptoms to prevent permanent ear damage this is from the government's own tb division website if this goal has to be achieved it is extremely important that audiometry testing is adopted so that more people need not undergo a debilitating and a disastrous thing like losing your hearing in a matter of minutes while while the government the central tb division or rntcp speaks about in their website speaks about dealing with autotoxicity or deafness due to tb drugs there is very little information on what patients who have already suffered autotoxicity must do dr dr khapardi i would request you that please look into this that when you speak about intersectoral approach while conducting audiometry for prevention is important it is also important to help in rehabilitating patients who have already suffered from hearing loss how do we do this you from the government can definitely tie up with the disability department and help in counseling our ntcp office counseling for all patients please include counseling for side effects and counseling for autotoxicity or blindness as a part of your counseling regimen i was not given any form of counseling i took treatment from the private from the private sector where counseling is almost absent it is time that there is adequate counseling for persons with disabilities second it is extremely important that the government shows a way how to rehabilitate them in terms of economic empowerment and jobs the government has several schemes under the disability department for economic empowerment and for providing skill development why doesn't the health why doesn't the health ministry tie up with the disabled disability department to cover to to provide skill development and economic empowerment for persons with disabilities for people who have suffered who have become pwds because of tb i think it is equally the responsibility of the tb division to see to it that a, that patients like me are rehabilitated besides counseling and jobs is extremely important that subsidized aids are provided the government has a scheme for providing subsidized aids you can definitely help us get subsidized aids because treating tb is extremely costly and on top of that all of the disability aids are extremely expensive it is sub- providing subsidized aids will definitely help us definitely help us reduce the out of pocket expenditure that you spoke about in your in your speech and in your ppt next i call for bridging the information gap what do i mean by this i was not born deaf i became deaf because of tb and i had it right in the middle of my life at the age of 23 when i had hearing for close to 23 years of my life as a as a person faced with disability all of a sudden i knew nothing about it nor was there help externally for me it is extremely important that the government provides information while tre- uh, while the when you detect autotoxicity that the information gap is bridged such as the it exemptions that are available for persons with disabilities income tax exemptions available information on how to deal with hearing loss information on where the aids are available what are my rights as a person person with disabilities reservations for jobs the government has just passed a rule to provide reservation for jobs for persons with disabilities but i didn't know of this unless i found out but it is not everyone would be knowing this 
it is extremely important that the government and the tv division take this up to bridge the information gap for not just tv but also for disabled next i call upon bringing out data for auto toxicity i found out that the government has no specific data on how many people have lost their hearing because of tb hearing or blindness to devastating side effects there is no data on how many people have had autotoxicity or blindness because of tb because of this the government has not been able to estimate the exact gravity of the problem it is extremely important that there is that the government finds out and collects data on the number of people who have lost their hearing maybe just as tb has been made a notifiable disease maybe the government could ask the doctors to intimate them in case they have fa- ha- had patients who have lost their hearing or who have become blind auto toxicity data is ex- is the need of the hour is extremely needed right now to understand the gravity of the problem that the government is staring at unless you take up data the first three goals will not be achieved because you need to know the number of people who are having this problem and then take up their rehabilitation right so i hope that the government adopts an intersectoral approach because you are not just fulfilling goals for ending tb you are also fulfilling goals for me for making india an inclusive society and fulfilling goals for persons with disabilities time for an intersectoral approach on this thank you thank you very much nandita uh, it was a very lucid description really i am listening for the first time a very detailed description how this happened we have lot of sympathy with you and we hope things will be better as we are already having a connection with dr soni so therefore with this uh, we will now uh, pass on to the discussion open discussion but before that i would like to say uh, and summarize one thing that this is the disease of antiquity you know it was described by hippocrates in 1400 bc nearly one third of the world population even more than that is suffering from tuberculosis to just to highlight a situation that king george v who built king george medical college in lucknow died of chronic pneumothoraces itself and diagnosis and treatment of tb is not easy but now very expensive but good tests are available genotype tests are available by which the confirmation can be done and all the disease should be confirmed before the treatment is starts so that such disabilities which have been created should not occur and all the possible you know precautions should be taken for that and counseling and those things should be done impyma is a very dreaded complication of pus in pleural cavity with damaged lung and making them unfit for for any uh, routine surgery it is cured sometimes what happens tb is cured but they need oxygen cylinders even small ones to breathe every now and then madam shobha has already documented such a story several times in the record the report went to the planning commission now onward to madam shobha for conducting that open session thank you nandita's testimony has left us speechless indeed but thanks nandita for breaking the silence that engulfs you before we throw this session open to the participants for their comments clarifications and experience sharing i would like to invite our lead commentator today to start the discussion she is none other than abia akram who is the focal point of asia pacific constituency of people with disabilities at the asia pacific regional civil society engagement mechanism and leads the asia pacific women with disabilities group with a personal experience of dis- physical disability abia akram has been engaged in the activities of disability movement since 1997 she also coordinates efforts of including persons with disabilities in the implementation of the 2030 agenda and its sustainable development goals established the national forum of women with disabilities independent living center with special talent exchange program aging and disability task force commonwealth young disability peoples forum the list goes on and on abia i would request you to please share your thoughts briefly as we are sadly running out of time over to you 
thank you very much. This is Abhi Akram from Pakistan, and thank you for the introduction and the wonderful presentations uh, from Dr. Akram. And and um, this is really an honor for me to share some of the thoughts from the Asia Pacific Women with Disabilities perspective, and also from the APRSM, the Asia Pacific Regional Mechanism on the Civil Society Engagement. Um, since 1997, we have been engaged and working on the disability sector. We have seen a shift from the charity based to the medical and the medical to the social perspective. And this is really important to learn what are the areas where we thought like disability need to be mainstreamed in the health, in the education, in overall development. And it's only possible if we have the services for 10 to 15 percent of the total population because initially if we're just taking like uh, the rehabilitation is the most important part of their life but within the rehabilitation there were several discrimination which was faced by the persons with disability if they go to the doctor they don't have sign language interpreters how they can explain what are the challenges they are facing uh, same is the case with the disease and few, uh, like protection from these diseases because especially the tb because there was no way of communication to explain to those persons with disabilities like how to care or how to protect yourself and thirdly, especially when we talk about women with disability, whenever they go to the doctor, they ask different questions like, um, have you consulted with a doctor for your physical appearance? Instead of checking their lungs, their treatment or health concern, they just directed it for their surgeries or rehabilitation. Because initially, it was only focused on the physical appearances of the person, not their health or all their internal safety. So that. Um, the shift came when we have signed and ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. And the disabled people organizations moved a bit from all the over the countries and especially in the Asia Pacific in, in uh, 1980s or 1990s, they have taken it as a singular project to include the disability perspective in the development. Unfortunately, the Millennium Development Goals, it still didn't uh, mention anything about the disability. That's why we have again forgot about the whole huge number of persons with disabilities in all the sectors. But then the DPOs, the disabled people organizations have fighting for their rights on the country level, on the grassroots level, and then they linked it to the uh, overall development of the country and also they talk on the national level and at the same time they talk on the regional level because they thought like it's very important whatever we are doing first accepting the disability and at the same time uh, fighting for our rights is very important. We have to talk about our rights on all these platforms to bring those practical examples, like how women with disabilities are committed suicide. I personally met with many women with disability. They were forced for the forced sterilization. There were no any other option for them to deal with their disabilities because of intellectual disabilities or physical disabilities even they can't explain that like how the parents and the family members are treating with them but at the same time on what happened is like when we bring those graduate level experiences to the regional perspective then there was a movement building and everybody acknowledged that it's very important to talk about the inclusion of persons with disabilities in the policies in the legislation. I would just briefly go through some of the articles that we have successfully included in the sustainable development goals, the references on the disability. Um, and there was like out of like 17 goals, 13 are particularly related to persons with disability. But only uh, seven targets have an explicit reference to the disability. And there were another goals and targets reference the vulnerable groups and including the person with disabilities because of the reference in paragraph 23 of the 2030 agenda, 
preamble and i would say like this is very important to know for all the stakeholders even for the un for the international organization for the grassroots organization because this is where we are going to fight and we are going to talk about more of our rights on the health and uh, service provision for the persons with disabilities your rehabilitation your inclusion the uh, point where it mentioned of reference in the sustainable development goals for all or all women and men so this was also a very uh, good reference for making like all men it means like all the persons with disability and men with disabilities to be included even without any such references the goals and targets will be applicable to person with disability by simply virtue of the university which applies to all and the overreaching principles of leaving no one behind uh can we go to next slide please okay and the persons with disabilities where we have 11 references there were human rights paragraph number 19 and vulnerable groups paragraph number 3 23 and education where we have mentioned about the paragraph number 25 yeah next please and these goals who have like uh, target about the inclusive education there were two references were made employment one reference made and reducing inequalities there was also one reference in goal 10 and goal 11 inclusive cities inclusive cities it covers like all the accessibility the communication the engagement of persons with disabilities and also the goal number 17 means of implementation and data we just uh, like we have discussed in the pre previous presentation data is very important because we have only the estimated one 10 to 15% of the total population but most of the countries they even in their census they didn't include the numbers and the database of person segregation segregated database that's why we can't identify like how many of them are getting the services or how many of them are living uh, marginalized or the vulnerable lives so how we could identify especially in the disaster situation we have quite a lot like of references where persons with disabilities unfortunately died because we didn't know where they are existing and how much of them are there so data collection is also very important the references to vulnerable is also very important because uh, wherever the vulnerable is referenced throughout the agenda 18 times these provisions directly apply to persons with disability this is not enough to target them as the vulnerable group because uh, most of the organization they just include vulnerability and they get uh, children women widows everyone in one group but we personally when we talk or highlight the rights of person with disability we said it's very important to make the different uh, like um, identification of the different groups like persons with disabilities older people children older persons with disabilities but so that's also very important and the disability movement purpose the term, term at risk rather than vulnerable because vulnerability like government also gets include that everyone and person with disabilities are the most difficult one to approach and we normally forgot them so it's very important to identify those and yeah in the employment they have goal number 8 promote sustainable inclusive and sustainable economic growth full and productive employment and decent work for all i have shared the slides with you like for the detailed description because it took a bit longer to talk about all the different uh, goals but i think in the end like it's very important like how the sustainable development goals is relevant to the country's perspective the national level perspective because you have the national constitution uh, where you mention about the health sector about the education sector about everything so it's very important to creating a linkages between the regional um, frameworks the sustainable development goals and our legally binding documents like the cdaw crpd uh, the convention on the rights of persons with disability and also we have the asia pacific decade on disability which mention about the 
make the right real uh, whole decade on disability and they prefer the work on insurance strategy so these all need to be included in one document and can be replicated in the con country's context and need to be linked with that and then we also need to focus on the twin track twin track approach uh, in one way we have to identify the rights of persons with disabilities who are the activists the leaders like um uh, 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 uh okay sorry i missed me uh, how she is working and how she is a role model for all the women in the asia pacific so how she is working in the field and a uh, cope with her disability we need to identify those persons with disability and at the same time information need to be shared with all the development sector with all key stakeholders to know and integrate with that and also on the south asia and the asia pacific region how we are creating the linkages with this the ministry of organization because disability or the rights of persons with disability can be integrated if we don't focus on the ministry development processes so it's very important like how we are going to work on on all these uh, groups and taking with them and also uh, the link between the CIPD and the SDGs is important because we have seen like implementing the SDGs must be in line with the build upon existing international and national commitments and mechanism um another point that SDGs draw particular attention to commitment to empower persons with disability and the number of goals and targeted that are also found in the UNCRPD and uh, the UNCRPD should serve as a guiding framework for implementing the SDGs in order to realize the full inclusion and empowerment of persons with disability only by utilizing the CRPD to implement the SDGs will be ensured that exclusion and inequalities are not cleared or such as like institutional attitudinal physical and legal barriers and how we are using the ICT the information communication technology for it like just recently we had an example like on the south asia level we have launched the mobile app award and they got with the coordination of the government of pakistan and other governments of the countries like bangladesh sri lanka and they found out like it's very easy to promote the information about the health services for persons with disabilities to these technology and simple apps because then you can just get the information with your cell phones if you are visually impaired then you can download the software and it's easy to understand and secondly if you are deaf or hearing impaired then a sign language interpreter can be available on the skype on the simple app and you just go to the doctor and ask them like what is your concern and they can share or take the online like uh, interpreter with you and it's easy to communicate so these are the small examples which we can use for the te- uh, like the technology can be used for ensuring the good health and uh, facilities for persons with disabilities you go next please um like all the uh, sdgs articles which in line with the crpd it's uh, article number 3 on the general principles number 4 general obligations number 5 equality and non discrimination and number 6 is a woman with disabilities it's again goal 5 of the sdgs but still it's linked with the crpd goal number 6 goal number uh, article 7 children with disability article number 8 awareness raising number 9 it's accessibility and number 11 um that mention about the situation of the risk and humanitarian emergencies equal recognition before the law that's the article number 12 and it's also mentioned in the sdgs article number 13 it's on access to justice and article number 20 it's personal mobility and 21 freedom of expression and opinion and 31 article is about statistics and data collection and article number 
two is international cooperation and number 33 it's national implementation and monitoring so this is how we link it with the sustainable development goals because it's all connected and we can see about awareness raising about you know connecting with different organizations is also very important and what we thought like the tpos the disabled people organization have a very important role to play because these are the organizations who raise their voices who have the practical experiences who are working in the grassroots and they know what are the solutions of it because if you just go and talk maybe uh, especially uh, if i put the example of women with disability in the rural areas the non-disabled people if it, they want to meet them they won't allow them to talk to them because it's quite difficult for them to understand what exactly disability is but if a woman with a disability will go they will allow them to talk and start the peer counseling and sharing the information peer counseling again is very important because um, uh, through the peer counseling you just get that information we don't need to force anyone but get just sharing the ideas and learning from each other work with institutions such as like WHO, UNESCO, UNICEF, universities, and all who can push for change is very important. Okay, uh, um, uh, and then create an advocacy project um, is also important because we have seen like um, the information and all this uh, like practical examples, there is no platform on the country and media is showing a very negative picture about disability all the time. They just focus, the person is sitting on a corner and crying and we never talk about the employment opportunities or engagement as leaders or the decision making. It's not like in, uh, giving them the access to the table, it's just the kind of a beneficiaries we talk. We never engage them on the policy level, on the discussion level, or in the implementation. If we have some um, like a very good structures of the health provision, we need to see where persons with disabilities are playing their role. How we are getting them on board to uh, give their practical examples and the evidence projects and findings of the different stakeholders is also very important. Next, please. Yeah, these are some of the references where you can get more information about the high level political forum, the resolution on the disability and development, Beijing platform for action, and the outcome and 2030 agenda um, funding for development. So these are the places where we can get more information and we could discuss it in um, further detail like how we see and uh, increase the role in the policies, in the community level, in the engagement of all the programs level, college level. So these are the areas and we can envision a society which is fully inclusive for persons with disability if we truly accomplish or work together with different stakeholders. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abhya. We were also supposed to have Steve Bradley with us today, but unfortunately his guide dog, Nickel, got attacked and so he's busy attending to him. Nonetheless, I would like to share what he has sent to us over Skype. Steve Bradley took medicines for drug-resistant TB in London, UK. And these medicines, they had a very devastating effect on him. They took his optic nerve away and caused a lot of other side effects like taking away the nerves in his hands and legs. He has no Flexes now, he cannot see. TB drugs have caused all these problems and we are in solidarity with him. Nandita has already expressed what is a life to live with disability, even if you get cured of TB. And so is Steve, another such example, and that too from London. We would close now. It has been a very special session today that had many lessons for me and perhaps for all of you too about looking at life from the perspective of specially enabled people. My sincere thanks to Dr. Khaparde and Ms. Andita Venkatesan, whose insightful talk has surely inspired us to think differently in a more integrated manner.
Thanks to lecture chair, Professor Ramakant, and to all the participants. The lecture got streamed on YouTube. Its recording and audio podcast will be made available to each one of you soon. Goodbye and best wishes till we meet again next month. <laughs>